you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That was a prediction made by Jesus to his disciples just before he ascended into heaven. And sure enough, a few days later, it happened. They received power, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were in a room, and the room was filled with wind to the point where it was, it was, it was described as a violent wind. Uh, and then it looked like flames. It was the, even Luke, as he was trying to explain it, was having a hard time explaining what he understood, that flames looked like came to, to rest on every human being. But it was clear that the people in the room were filled with the Spirit, and then the fun began. And the power of God started to course in them and through them, and the story changed the world, and I'm going to get ahead of myself because we're going to cover that on the 25th anniversary and afterward, and I can't wait to unpack Acts chapter 2 with you with some new thoughts that I think God has for us as a people. But in the meantime, um, here's what I want to ask this morning. What happened between the prediction and the fulfillment. There was a period of time, number of days, between Acts 1-8 and Acts 2-1, what happened? Well, a couple things happened. One of them we know was kind of an unusual choosing of a new leader because, you know, the apostles, the disciples lost one. Judas took his own life. It was awful, horrible story. Took his own life and they had to replace him and so they cast lots and they decided this guy named Matthias was going to take his place the interesting thing is, it's the first time we hear of Matthias, and it's the last time we hear of Matthias. We never hear, <laughs> hear of him. Hear from again, bless his heart. I'm sure he's quite a powerful individual. But um, there was something else that happened between Acts 1 8 and Acts 2 1. Something that really changed the world, and it's really what caused the prediction to become the fulfillment. It's summarized in these seven words. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Now, we don't get the intensity of these words in English, but joined together means they were unanimous. There was nobody out of the picture. Every single one of them were engaged. And when it says they were constantly in prayer, that means an intensity and a con uh, they were continuously in prayer. I mean, almost from the time Jesus left them to the time the Holy Spirit came, this is all they did. They devoted themselves to prayer. I'm telling you, it is overwhelming to me when I consider how much time they gave to prayer. And it, it raises a theological conundrum. I think it's somewhat controversial. I've wrestled with this for all 38 years of ministry, and that is, it seems to me, it seems to me that if we don't pray, God doesn't act. As a matter of fact, John Wesley said that. He said, God does nothing except in response to, <clears throat> to believing prayer. And I got to agree with him. I, I am sure there are moments, there have been moments in history where God has unilaterally decided to do something. We all know that. He's unilaterally done things to change people or change the world. But for the most part, God is like this. He's waiting. He's waiting to know how much this means to us. He's waiting to know how, how much do you need this? How much do you want this? Because when you ask, I will respond. And they knew this intuitively. They all joined together constantly in prayer. And I'm telling you, this is especially true when it comes to this business of revival, this, uh, this awakening of our souls, awakening of our church, Awakening of our community, awakening of our nation. I don't know, does anybody disagree with, do you think we need revival right now? I think we need revival, right? Well, don't miss this. A guy, this old, old guy, Arthur Tappan Pearson, he said this, I agree, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. And that should get our attention. Look, if the Holy Spirit is the catalyst for revival, then prayer is the conduit of revival. It's how it's going to happen. Passionate, earnest prayer is the channel of the power of God. Corporate, intense prayer is the means by which God unlocks heaven. There is no revival without prayer. So church... 
Guess what this means we need to do? Uh, this is a pretty simple application to this sermon today. We need to pray. But how? Man, there are dozens of ways to I got a book on my bookshelf by, by uh, Richard Foster. It's just called Prayer. And in there are 21 chapters, and there are 21 different ways to pray. All right, so how, if we're supposed to pray constantly, we're supposed to pray intensely, we're supposed to pray unanimously, how should we go about it? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that of all those different ways to pray, there are four that stand out in my mind that are most crucial, most essential if we want to have a spiritual awakening in our own lives or in our nation or in our community. Here they are. Four essential prayers for revival. Number one, prayers of consecration and repentance. We're going to talk about that for the rest of the morning. Consecration and repentance, I will explain those words. Number two, I'll cover this next week. Prayers of boldness, bold prayers, uh, prayers full of faith. That's next week. Uh, The third week of the series, of this uh, part two of this Wind and Fire series, Tim is going to open up John 15 to us and talk to us about prayers of abiding. And then the last week of the series, I'll be back, and we're going to talk about what it means to be persistent in prayer. Four essential prayers For revival. Now, I'm going to tell you, we're not just going to talk about prayer. We're not just going to theorize about prayer. We're not just going to theologize about prayer. We are going to pray over the next uh, over the next 30 days and beyond. And I've been wrestling with how we should do this. I mean, the original idea is let's do a 25-day prayer challenge because it's our 25th year, and that would be symmetrical, and it would be all. Wonderful, and then I wrestled with it. I'm going to write my own prayer journey for us. For, and so I started working on it, and I would write, and I'd crumble it and throw it away, and I would write, crumble it. And I just could, it wasn't, nothing was coming. I was having prayer writer's block. Um, <laughs> and I remembered, oh, I just want us to pray like we did back in February when we had that, remember when that 40-day prayer challenge, and I mean, by our estimates, we had about 3,000 people praying every day for 40 days, and it was so cool. We were using Mark Batterson's book, uh, Draw the Circle, and I just wanted to feel what we felt in February. I just wanted us to pray like we did in February, and then God said, do it again. So, friends, we're going to do the 40-day prayer challenge all over again. We're going to use Mark Batterson's book, Draw the Circle, as our basis, and there are a bunch of them out, thousands of them out, but we got more for you in the bookstore. We're going to start next Sunday, August 21st, 40 days. Every day we're going to pray from August 21st through September 30th, and I have a goal this time. I don't want 3,000 people praying. I don't want 4,000 people praying. Let me just cut to the chase. I want 6,000 people praying every day for 40 days. Who's in? Who's in? All right. I counted about 15 of you who raised your arms. <laughs> raised your hands. So that's, a, that's off to a start. Not a fast start, but we're going to get 6,000 people praying. So get your books. We're also, the pastors are writing a, a prayer, uh, what? Guide. guide. Prayer guide to go along with it, and there'll be 40 strategic prayers. Uh, We're going to gear you up for prayer for the next 40 days, and I got more ideas, and I'll talk about that next week. (laughs) Pastors don't even know what I've been thinking about. We got some ideas. We're going to pray. Anybody want to join me in prayer? We are going to pray. Now, at this point in my sermon, normally it feels like a good transition point, and I would say, so let me review where we are, have been in the last four or five weeks. Problem is I don't have time to review. So um, here, I'm just going to say this. Friends don't let friends miss sermons, okay? <laughs> so if you got a friend and didn't see any of the sermon messages of the past five weeks, do you realize that you can, we have this wonderful technology now where you can go online and watch the sermons? Did you know that? You can watch the sermons live. Yeah, we, that was available about 100 years ago, but it's there now. <laughs> uh, watch the sermons over the past five weeks. We laid out a theology of the Holy Spirit that is crucial, is crucial, and you don't want to miss it. But, all right, uh, that's the mini review. Been watching the Olympics? Oh, yeah, I've been watching too much of the Olympics. Uh, we have been privileged over the past week to watch the heights of human physical skill. How about the guy at Mo last night in the 10,000 meter? I'm telling you what, was that an incredible race? A pharaoh, is that his name? Yeah. Mo. Oh, at any rate, phenomenal, phenomenal. Budaya and Johnson right here from central Indiana. 
Michael Phelps, what's he won, like 352 gold medals or something. <laughs> Simone Biles, who is this child? She's amazing, she's amazing. They've all, they've, they've all torn it up, but I want to point out one habit they all practice, every single one of them. They do it all in different ways, but they warm up. Have you noticed that? Unlike me, if I'm going to go out and run or walk or something, I don't warm up and then I pay the price for it, right? But they, before they dive into what they're going to do, before they even walk in the arena, they start doing their thing. They warm up. They prepare themselves. They stretch. They do repetitions. Some of them meditate. Some of them mean mug, like Michael Phelps. Uh, they do all kinds of warm-ups. So when we pray, if we're going to pray prayers for revival, we need to warm up. There are ways we need to start praying. You don't just dive in. God, do this, do this. Please do this, do this, do this. We need this. No, no, no. You got to, you got to prepare. And I'm going to suggest two ways to prepare to get us to the point where we can go to God with boldness. And I'm going to show you these two ways by telling you two stories. And you're going to need the Bible to see the stories. Turn to Joshua chapter 3, page 152. The Bible's under the seat in front of you. Or open up your apps or your electronic Bible, and here we go. Joshua chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1 in just a moment. <clears throat> Historical context, though, this is 1400 B.C. Uh, this is the people of God are standing at the Jordan River. They're about to enter the Promised Land, and it has been a tough 40 years. An entire generation wandering around in the desert. They had come out of Egypt they blew it when their first chance to go into the promised land, and now God sent them off for 40 years. But finally they get to the point where they're, they're at, the, uh, at the Jordan. They've sent out spies into the promised land, and they're just about to take the land that God wants them to have. And here's where we pick up the story. Look what happens next, Joshua 3.1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out for Shittim and went to the Jordan when, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, and they gave orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, who are the Levites, carrying it, you're to move out from your positions and follow it. And you'll know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 1,000 yards between you and the Ark. Don't go near it. And Joshua told the people, and here's what I want you to see. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Con Let me read it again. You can look on the screen because I have it up here now. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. This was a prayer of consecration. Before we go and God brings revival, before God starts, we need to consecrate ourselves. What does that mean to consecrate yourself? Well, literally the word consecrate means to watch, watch this. You take this. And you consecrate it. You put it here. You set it apart. It's a different thing. So you need to consecrate yourselves because what we're about to experience is a time unlike any other. So we need to consecrate ourselves. We need to set ourselves apart, set our hearts about, uh, apart, and prepare for what God is going to do. It is a, a consecration prayer is a, is a hold the presses prayer. A consecration prayer is a, is a stop what you're doing. I can imagine even that Joshua looked out over all the people and he said, hey, kids, kids, shh. You with the camels back there, stop it. Everyone, pay, everyone, can I have everybody's attention? This is a time unlike any other. We can't treat this like normal day to day because what is about what we're about to experience is the actions of God, so consecrate yourselves. Now, I don't know that he did this, but every time I was thinking about it this week, my arm just went like that. Because it felt like that's what Joshua was saying. Consecrate yourselves. Like, stop. I think with a consecration prayer, there's a big old pregnant pause, like, ooh, what's going to happen next? See, this is how we need to start. Before we start diving in and asking God for stuff, it's got to be stop. Can I give you a little, probably the best consecration prayer ever uttered? I know it's the best because Jesus uttered it. He said this. You want to join in with me as soon as I start saying this, you can. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. That's how he started the Lord's Prayer. He started with a consecration prayer. Our Father in heaven, I'm not you. And this right here, we want all of who you are to be right here. That's a consecration prayer, and that's how we need to start. Don't just dive in. Start with consecration. Story number two is a, a second kind of prayer that goes along with consecration prayer. Turn to Joshua chapter 3. That's page 152, and I'll tell you another story. Ah, uh, my bad. My bad. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7. You, you're falling on the app. Somebody's telling me where I'm going next. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11. That's page 312. Second Chronicles. The problem with 2 Chronicles, and you know, I've been studying the Bible for th all, 38 years in ministry. I can never find it. <laughs> I, I have this, like, mental block about Chronicles. Like, where is that? I don't know. Page 312. So watch this. Watch this. If consecration prayer looks like this, I want to talk about repentance, which looks like this. This is a coming before God in humility and repentance. And it's absolutely essential. Here's the context, 2 Chronicles 7, 11. This is 400 years after the other story. Uh, they're in the promised land. They have a king. It's Solomon. He's the third king that they've had. And he's just built a temple because his dad, David, wasn't able to build a temple to God, so Solomon builds the temple. So it goes through a number of months, maybe years, in building the temple. And in chapter 7, verse 1, the, the temple's all done, and Solomon prays a prayer, and then God, whoosh, comes down in some sort of glory, some sort of something I don't even know we can understand. It's like this ultimate spiritual humidity where they're overwhelmed with the presence of God. And it says the priests could not go in the temple. They're so overwhelmed, and it said most of the people were just falling on the ground, they're on their knees, and they're worshiping, so it's all good. I mean, it was one of the high points in the people of God. Now, a few days later, something happens, and that's where we're going to pick up the story in 2 Chronicles 7, 11. So when Solomon, follow along, when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and his own palace... The Lord appeared to him at night, and he said, I've heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. In other words, it's all good. I like what you've done here. Now, there's not this word in, this he in the Hebrew between verses 12 and 13, but I wrote it in here because I think you could put the word but here. I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices, but... Verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. In other words, it's all good right now, but a day is coming where it's not going to be all good. You are going to mess up. You're going to be sinning, and I'm going to have to discipline you. So at some point, Solomon, in the future, it's going to go south so here's what you need to do. Look at verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In other words, I will bring revival if and only if you learn how to repent. You consecrate yourselves, and you learn how to repent. He says, and this is the way he describes it, you need to seek my face. It means you've got to come right to me. I am God and you're not, but you need to seek my face. That phrase was the phrase they used when you, when you would go to a, a king. I'm going to seek the face of the king. You need to seek my face. And then he says, you need to humble yourselves. And humble is this. It's just this. It means literally to bend the knee. You need to seek my face. You need to humble yourself. And then he says, you need to turn from your wicked ways. It's the uh, Hebrew word shob, which implies two things. It implies a, an about face, which I've always, I, 
I've illustrated this many times where you walk in one way, you turn and go, that's show, but that's the Hebrew word. It also implies oral confession. Seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, humble yourselves, because there will be no power, there will be no revival, there will be no kind of healing without this kind of corporate prayer. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will not fall upon us until we get on our knees in repentance. That's just true. That's just true. There is no revival without prayer. Prayer that begins with consecration. It's a time like any, this is not a time like any other. This is a different time. And then repentance. What's repentance sound like? Well, here's what it sounds like. O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and we've done wrong. We've been wicked, and we've rebelled, and we've turned away from your commands and laws. And O Lord, we are covered with shame. Now that's a prayer of Daniel. Prophet Daniel. Here's another one. Oh my God, I'm, I'm too ashamed to disgrace to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads. I love Hebrew poetry. I, our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. That's a prayer of Ezra. Here's another. Oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, I confess the sins, we including myself, me, including me, including my father, including my father's house. We've committed, all of us have committed against you. We have acted wickedly. We've not obeyed your commands. That's a prayer of Nehemiah. Here's one more. This is from Moses. He was so distraught over the sins of his people that this is some, maybe some of the most extreme repentance I've ever read about. Now, he describes his repentance, and you can read this in, in Deuteronomy chapter 9. He describes his repentance this way. Listen. He said, I fell, I didn't just go to my knees. I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. Getting uncomfortable yet? <laughs> I was counting to 40 and praying. That was 40 seconds. Moses prayed for 40. How, how long? <sighs> he goes on to say, and I ate no food, and I don't get this next thing, how he survived, and I drank no water. I don't, think you, I don't know how you survive. I want to tell you something. I, <clears throat> I wish I would not have read that this week. And I'm, I'm shooting straight with you because I'm under deep conviction about my own lack of Repentance. Well, I feel bad. I feel bad about myself. I feel bad at my sin. And I'm not afraid to tell God. I do tell God. And I'm sorry I did that and I repent of that. I feel bad about the, where we are as a society. I do. And I, and I just, and I, mostly I fuss about that and worry about that. And I got to tell you, though, I am not engaged in the level of repentance that I think is going to bring revival yet. Have you? Uh-uh. Consecrate yourselves. This is a time unlike any other. Yeah. And we got to learn how to repent. Amen. 
The world has lost the power to blush over its vice. And the church has lost her power to weep over it. It may well be, Martin Luther King said, that we have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, just wait on time. So this is where we start. This is where we start, uh, right here. God, here's what we've done. We're sorry. Here's what we've done. And here's how we repent. And God, here's what we haven't done. We're sorry. And we repent. There is no revival without prayer. I'm talking serious prayer. Prayer that begins with consecration and repentance. We need to get started.